Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mark Caden with AALU. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today as part of our regular series, Navigating the New Administration. You know, we're about six weeks out of uh, Election Day, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of activity has transpired. You know, cabinet appointments have been, have been made and announced. You know, traffic's been locked down in New York City for the better part of a month, and uh, you know, we're hard at work here at ALU, you know, serving your interests so that you may continue to serve the best interests of your clients. And, um, you know, we, we, we really have two prongs that we're working on. We have, uh, you know, an education component, which is really what this is all about. We want to make sure you have the insights you need to be effective when you're talking to, whether it's, you know, our panelists today, Sam Sheth, um, who's one of the foremost experts in the, in the corporate markets. You know, you're talking to CFOs, CEOs, boards, et cetera, or, or uh, you're talking to attorneys, CPAs, referral sources. You're talking to clients, prospects. People have questions. You know, we want to make sure that we're doing our best to give you the information based on our insights, being experts in the advocacy process, so that when you're talking to whoever the constituency is, you're armed with the information that will ultimately help them either advise or take action to do the planning that you know they need and we know they need. You know, one of the things that's kind of a bedrock principle for us here at ALU is that in the country's underinsured, you know, the retirement security continues to be a, a, an issue. And there's really only one industry, and that's the life insurance industry, that will help individuals with their financial security. So that's what we're all about. We're obviously uh, neck deep in the second prong, which is advocacy. Uh, we're also joined today by Jeff Reschetti, who's uh, one of the foremost tax uh, lobbyists in all of Washington uh, and has been working with ALU for the better part of a decade on a number of different issues. Um, that, uh, that we care about, whether it's the estate tax or the issues affecting the corporate tax, tax uh, uh, planning issues, that's, that's what we're here for. So today we're going to uh, talk about tax reform. We're going to get a perspective from Sam, who's out in the market every day uh, talking to clients, hear what he's hearing, and perhaps more importantly, hear what he's saying to help our uh, help his clients continue to do the, the planning that they need. As I mentioned at the outset, this is part of a series that we're doing, Navigating the New Administration. We've done a number of communication tools, all available on our website, aalu.org, under the advocacy section. We did uh, you know, post-election analysis webinar two days after the, the election. We've done, uh, our very own Justin Brown hosted a webinar recently about the estate tax issues specifically. Uh, just yesterday, we put out a white paper on tax reform that includes our analysis of what uh, what's ahead. So um, we really want to be engaged with you in a dialogue. We want to help you understand what we're doing on the advocacy side, what our insights are, so that you're more effective with your clients. And today's teleseminar is intended to be interactive. So if you're logged in on the WebEx, uh, you can click on the Q&A uh, section. I've got it open right now, so please, you know, type in your question and, and we'll get to them. Uh, if we don't get to everybody's questions, we'll do a follow-up podcast that, that addresses any unanswered question. Uh, you can also email me at caden at alu.org or email ask at alu.org with any questions or any suggestions that you have. So. With that, let's dig in, uh, and Sam, uh, let's, let's start with you. Um, before we sort of talk about tax reform as a, as a public policy issue, maybe you can just give our members a perspective about what you're hearing from the marketplace or people deferring plans, or, and, and what are you hearing generally about tax reform? Sure. Um, and, and my perspective really comes from that of working with uh, primarily larger corporations and banks in the areas of corporate and bank owned uh, life insurance as well as some insurance companies and I think what we're hearing is um, a high level of um, 
uh, interest in what's going on. I think, you know, clearly there's been a number of uh, uh, things out in the press as far as uh, what the priorities may be for the new president-elect, uh, as well as the Congress. Um, uh, certainly a lot of discussion of the kind of Ryan Brady uh, tax blueprint. Um, and everybody is paying attention to what is going on. Uh, but I think they are all uh, tending to stay the course uh, with regard to their current plans, uh, their current uh, funding uh, for various employee benefits, um, and are not quick to make changes given that, you know, if you look at the last maybe 16 years, uh, there has been an unprecedented amount of new regulation or laws uh, proposed and discussed, uh, including things like the camp draft uh, that never really went anywhere. And then other uh, pieces of legislation that uh, went forward, but it, it much slower uh, than people expected. And what they started looking like from the beginning uh, was very different than what, they, what came out sort of the back end uh, in terms of regulation. And then oftentimes when those new laws or regulations were enacted, such as 409A that affected many non-qualified plan sponsors. It took several years for additional regulations to come out um, so that companies could comply. So I think many uh, corporate executives today are kind of shell-shocked by the amount of new regulation that they've had to deal with over the last several years and are reluctant to start making changes to uh, their existing strategies until new laws are enacted or at least uh, well understood. Um, in other words, they're uh, paying attention but not making changes to their strategies based upon uh, sort of the conjecture that's out there now uh, in the press and otherwise. Well, that's certainly consistent. <clears throat> you know, we, we've I've, I've talked to a lot of our members and. I think of the days after the election, there's no doubt that there was a lot of people that were shell-shocked across the country, including in the business community. But uh, as people you know, digest the results of the election uh, more fully, they realize that, you know, things that people campaign on, Trump has a, uh, President-elect Trump has a tax reform proposal that, you know, he talked about in the campaign, you know, the the House Republicans put out a blueprint on tax reform, all of all of which is, you know, referenced in our in our tax reform white paper. But one of the points we made uh, in the piece we sent out yesterday was that, you know, the ACA, you know, was obviously Obamacare was something the president campaigned on, but you know, the final legislation looked remarkably different than the the legislation that the president campaigned on and. Uh, it took two years to to come to fruition, and now a few years later, it's it's uh, going to likely be undone in large part. So, you know, there's a, a lot of a lot of room for um, maneuvering, and the legislative process is not clean and simple. And the president-elect and incoming administration, incoming Congress, have a lot of things that they're going to be juggling. So. But, but Sam, just sticking with you, and, and thank you for our first question. We've got our first question. Again, use the Q&A box. Keep the questions coming, uh, and we will get to them. But, you know, Sam, if you did have a client, you know, really whether it's on the corporate side or on the individual side that wanted to defer, you know, how would you handle it? You know, well, I think I would, I think I would counsel that client based upon their existing circumstances. In other words, if they had plans that were in place and it was a question of whether or not to try to adjust something now uh, or, uh, or wait until we have greater clarity, I would certainly say let's wait until we have some greater clarity as to what uh, any final new regulations or tax reform may look like. I think if it were a client that were waiting to enact a plan uh, in order to uh, see how tax reform ultimately played out, uh, that would largely depend upon their timing. I mean, if they were relatively young and had a fair amount of time to plan, 
um, that may be okay. But if they were older and uh, needed a plan in place, I would probably say, you know, let's continue to get a plan in place based upon the existing laws that, as we know them now. And if the laws change, uh, we can go ahead and modify those those plans in the future. And I guess I would try to build the flexibility into those plans so that they could be uh, modified easily down the road if there were changes in the tax laws. Yeah, and I think that's what we've heard over and over and over again from from our members who are you know neck deep in the planning process with their with their clients is that you have to you have to sort of plan for the laws that exist today um, because you know the laws will change and ebb and flow and the process will will take time and so the best thing that anyone can do is you know the only thing you know for certain is that the future is uncertain and that's the the importance of of, of planning today. You know, Sam, maybe we could dive in a little bit on kind of tax reform in your particular uh, business. You know, as you think about uh, tax reform writ large, what are the biggest minefields that you see? Is it some of the CANTRAP proposals, some of the, you know, the corporate tax rates? Is it, uh, is it you know, taxes on inside buildup? What are the things that are most uh, that you're most concerned about that you want to make sure ALU is active in advocating on your behalf? Well, um, I know that uh, AALU continues to fight on many different fronts uh, for the interest of our clients. And, um, you know, I think the camp draft proposals were of real concern both to uh, owners of Coley as well as sponsors of. Uh, non-qualified deferred compensation plans, uh, many of our clients. Um, we haven't really seen those proposals resurface yet. As, However, as you know, potentially they look for pay-fors, uh, I think we have to remain vigilant on those fronts. And I think really when it comes to the camp draft, um, you know, so much has been done in the area of Coley legislation, uh, most recently with 101J, uh, with deferred comp legislation, uh, under 409A, uh, I think clearly we have to con continue to beat the drums that these uh, programs are taxed uh, appropriately and that, um, you know, that Congress has spent many, many uh, efforts uh, debating over these issues and that they're well settled. So um, I think, you know, certainly if, if the camp proposals come back, we'll have to remain vigilant in, in giving that message. But, you know, I think probably from what we see in the in the uh, Ryan or the House uh, tax blueprint, uh, that's of most concern is um, a, ch a change in the corporate tax rate to 20%. And I'd say one of the greatest inconsistencies in that plan is that you have pass-through entities at 25%, which are really many of the small businesses across the country that are driving the economy. And then you have corporate, large corporate at 20%. And it's hard to see a way forward where uh, the big uh, corporations get a bigger tax cut than uh, small business around the country. That doesn't seem consistent with uh, certainly uh, the people that elected uh, Donald Trump or many of the Republicans that were either elected or reelected in the most recent election. So, um, so I, I would expect to ultimately see parity between that rate, those two rates. Um, and, you know, I think it's unlikely that the pass-through rate could drop any lower than 25%. So, but if it were to drop to 20, um, I think an easy way to say it would be, it would be twice as hard to sell Coley or Bowley. I mean, you've taken away potentially half the benefit, right? We're at 35% today. We dropped to 20. Um, we all know that, Coley and Boley are an excellent tool to recover the cost of employee benefits over the long term. Uh, but in the short term, uh, what makes them work well is the fact that um, companies can account for them um, and uh, without uh, regard to tax. And, um, you know, if you think about typical insurance contracts and the cost they're in, um, you know, the gambit works at a 35% tax rate today. I think at a 20% tax rate, it'll be 
uh, much more highly challenged unless we see a substantial rise in rates. Well, and I think part of the thing, you know, obviously you're in the large corporate marketplace. I think in many respects, we have so many members who are in the business insurance, you know, whether it's, you know, key man or, or uh, business succession issues, um, you know, buy sell agreements, you know, and so many of the camp draft proposals would impact, you know, let's call it the smaller case Coley. And I think in many respects, people hear Coley and they say, it's not my market. All I do is, is sell insurance to executives for business succession purposes. And that's, um, you know, obviously that, you know, corporate owned life insurance is really business life insurance. And whether it's to use the on non-qualified deferred comp or whether it's to, to use to uh, uh, for business succession purposes or replace a key employee and all of it is really good for for companies in their planning processes uh, and so we want to continue to encourage the use of you know corporate owned life insurance in all of its forms uh, and that's going to be something that we really that we really uh, press on. You know, Sam, just one more question, and I want to get uh, Jeff in, and, and thank you for uh, the questions. We've got a few more that are uh, flowing in. So, uh, again, use the Q&A box, you know, email ask at aelu.org. Uh, this is Mark Caden. I'm joined with Sam Sheff and Jeff Rochetti. But, Sam, I'm interested in, um, in how you use the information you get from ALU. You mentioned there's a lot of interest in what's happening in tax reform, and I'm curious if you have, uh, you know, how you position yourself as a subject matter expert based on the insights you get from ALU and your personal uh, engagement in the political process, how you use that to, to position yourself as a, you know, more credible advisors than maybe some people who could be uh, your competition. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, as you know, being out here in California, uh, apparently we're not all that tuned in to uh, uh, <laughs> the voter sentiment across America. Um, and so for us, uh, AALU provides a conduit into understanding clearly what's going on um, on the Hill, what the challenges are, what the roadblocks are, what the different groups that are advocating for one thing or another uh, are positioning themselves. And I think all of that knowledge uh, from the front lines is critically important to our clients. Um, they want to be in the know. They want to feel like they're getting real firsthand information on what's actually going on. Sometimes, as you know, I guess some people have accused the press of not always being honest. Um, I guess I would say it another way, which is I think there's a lot of bias in the press. And so people kind of report upon what they um, believe in. But ultimately, you know, companies want to make decisions based upon actual facts and, and, and actual potential regulations and legislation out there. So for us, AALU provides a very good way for us to remain connected to what's going on on the ground there, and then relaying that back to our clients so that they get a sense of uh, where they are. And so we certainly talk to our clients about our involvement with ALU and how important it is to protecting um, their interest uh, and the interest of their uh, plan participants. Um, we've talked to them about how instrumental ALU was in things like 409A and 101J and the various things that we've been through in the past where we've gotten fairly good outcomes for our clients ultimately, uh, although I, not always ideal. Um, and so I think it's a very important part of our business in order to be able to communicate to our clients that we're in touch with what's going on in the front lines. Well, I appreciate that. That's a pretty good segue. I mean, I've, I've always, I've always said that ALU, it's it, uh, First and foremost, about the member, it's about people like you, Sam, who, you know, are foremost experts in your field and the ability to, you know, meet with and build relationships with people like Sam is a is a huge, huge uh, value prop uh, that it's really only available 
at ALU across all of the distribution channels and carriers. Uh, but beyond that, our advocacy model provides us with unique insights that can help make our members more credible. So, and that's really what we're, we're about. And all of that serves the advocacy function. So, you know, Jeff, I want to get you involved here. Uh, and again, thank you for the questions. One, one last comment about uh, non-qualified deferred comp. Our very own Michael Goldstein uh, makes the point in the Q&A box that uh, even if corporate rates are reduced, non-qualified plans will still be popular because of the 401k limitations. So, uh, Michael, thank you uh, for that comment and for your engagement. Um, but Jeff, let me uh, let's get you involved in this discussion. You know, you're actively talking with members of Congress. You know, you've been around DC for a long time. You know, what are the major pushes and pulls that you see? ahead for uh, for Republicans and perhaps Democrats in tax reform? Sure. I, I think the biggest problem for Republicans with respect to the advancement of tax reform is they're very likely to have to do it on their own. I just don't see um, a good number of Democrats providing any backup or support for them for the venture the way it's currently being framed up with the blueprint being uh, the general direction uh, that they're heading in. And the reason for that is Democrats just don't buy the notion that tax cuts pay for themselves. Uh, they're, they're, uh, and history is kind of on their side in that uh, pointing to any circumstance where we've had a, a dramatic tax cut and we've seen dramatic growth in conjunction with it, such that the tax cut hasn't ended up costing the government uh, money over time and loss in federal revenues. And um, they're skeptical about that whole notion of dynamic scoring, that you can, through tax cuts, stimulate growth, and then through taxing the newly grown economy, recover what you lost from the cuts up front. Uh, and they're not uh, alone in that thinking. The Tax Policy Center, some of the most credible economists in the country who've been doing this scoring for decades, um, just recently evaluated Ryan's proposal. In a nutshell on it is on a static basis, they see that costing $4 trillion in the first 10 years and a gross of $12 trillion over 20 years. That's basically doubling our accumulated debt over the lifetime of our country in the next 20 years. Um, just to not be undone, uh, outdone on this, they also use their own modeling of dynamic scoring to say, all right, maybe there is some growth effect to doing these kinds of reforms and cuts under their projections, under their modeling, they see a cost still being north of $3 trillion over 10 years in, a, in aggregate in the vicinity of $9 trillion over 20, which is not surprising. Most economists, when you look at the macroeconomic effect of either spending or tax cuts, they see you know a 20, 30% return on your investment ostensibly in terms of a kickback from growth. And so that's what TPC has demonstrated. To make it worse, the Ryan outline assumes three trillion dollars in offsets in running up only four trillion dollars in cost. And the principal element of the two principal elements are a trillion dollars from this notion of border adjustability, which is basically a tax on imports. And the second is two trillion dollars from eliminating virtually every itemized deduction other than charitable contributions and, and health um, purchases. Um, so they got $3 trillion in offsets and they're still running $4 trillion in the hole. That assumes they get the $3 trillion in offsets, which is a big assumption. Uh, if they don't, this is going to be a $7 trillion bill. Um, and, uh, and so I think they're going to struggle with that entire challenge of what the broader budget implications of their proposal are. And in conjunction with that, um, TPC says virtually all the benefits go to the wealthiest 1%. So, um, again, I think when that news gets out, when Joe Sixpacks realize it's really not a tax break for them, but for the wealthy, I think they may have a considerably different view about it. The positive for them is they don't need Democrats to do this. Under reconciliation, they could do it on a straight Republican vote, though they can only afford to lose two senators because they have a 52-seat majority with two lost the vice president, the Republican, would break the tie and they could move a bill on a straight partisan vote. But in doing it in that manner, it will likely have to sunset because it will likely have uh, out-year cost implications similar to what uh, we saw with Bush's bill. So they're not going to give much help from Democrats. 
they may not need it. Uh, and this is a very, very costly proposition. So Jeff, maybe let's unpack. We, we talk a lot about reconciliation. Maybe you can just, what's the succinct uh, explanation for what reconciliation is and what it means? Um, maybe you could help our members with that. Sure. And understand it's been used several times. Clinton used it in 93. Bush used it in 01. Obama used it to pass Obamacare in 2009. The nutshell on it is if you want to avoid the Responsi the need to get 60 votes to overcome a filibuster in the Senate. There's a special process which is basically designed to balance up revenues with expenses. It's called reconciliation to reconcile your income with your outflow. Under that process, you don't need, um, you can pass a bill with a simple majority. When you control both chambers of Congress and the White House, Republicans could then move a bill with exclusively Republican support in the House and the Senate, signed by a Republican president. Um, in doing so, though, if that proposal costs money in the out years, in the second 10 years, you can't make it permanent, which is why Bush's tax cuts in 01 sunset. Clinton's raised revenue because he had a tax increase under reconciliation, not a cut, so Clinton could make his permanent. So, with what they're proposing, if TPC is at all right, this is gonna cost in the out year, so it would likely have to be sunset, so nothing's gonna be permanent here if they do it under reconciliation on a straight partisan um, Republican majority in the Senate. And, and Jeff, if, if that is the case, and I wanna come back and maybe talk about some of the uh, Senate Democrats who are up in red states and maybe a possibility of them joining, uh, joining on to the tax bill, but, but let's just stipulate for argument's sake that Republicans pass, um, first they repeal Obamacare, it seems like that will be done by you know January, end of February, that'll be the first uh, priority out of the box, and then the circle back on tax reform and do it in a partisan basis on a straight Republican ticket. So they will have repealed Obamacare on 100% party lines, and then passed and enacted fundamental tax reform dealing with the uh, corporate pass-through and individual tax rates, uh, and they did that on partisan lines. In, in your judgment, what are the political risks for, that Republicans will incur doing you know, two pretty substantial pieces of legislation, both on, on a pure partisan basis? Well, the, the primary risk is that this, uh, this bet doesn't work. This is basically a $4 trillion bet that you can stimulate growth. And if it doesn't work, it's, it's going to potentially bankrupt our country. It's going to put us in serious fiscal problems. We're starting with debt at already at 75% of GDP. Historically uh, high. It's high, high as it's been since World War II. So you start with a very uh, tenuous circumstance in the first place, and we're doubling down on debt. Should that not um, that debt not generate the growth that they're wishing for, uh, we're going to be stuck with a massive uh, federal debt. And again, if you appreciate the tax policy center's analysis, and most of the tax cuts go to wealthy, they're not the folks that elected Donald Trump. They're you know a bunch of white, blue collar, working class, high school educated voters are not your top one percent that's getting virtually all of the tax cuts. They don't benefit from repeal of the estate tax. They don't benefit from repeal of the alternative minimum tax. They don't benefit from the reduction in uh, tax on investment income. They don't have assets invested. They don't have assets. So um, you could see a fairly serious political backlash when the voter, voters kind of realize what's being peddled. There was a, just a stat out today that I thought was stunning, which is the um, basically Bush's cabinet has accumulated wealth that's as much as one third of our population. That if you summed up everything that one third of our population owns, it's equal to what is held by the hand, the 15 or so folks who are staffing Bush's cabinet or uh, Trump's cabinet. It's, you know, when these kinds of facts sink in and when you realize where the, the tax cuts going, I think there's very serious risk. Again, they may be able to persuade people that they're going to create jobs and this is a good thing for them, but it's a very um, a tenuous play in my judgment. 
Um, and the other thing you raised is their, the challenges that they have going forward in light of the rest of their agenda. And, you know, you've hit the big one, which is they're going to repeal Obamacare, and I believe they're going to be successful. But it's kind of interesting. They're going to do it while delaying the effective date um, either two or three years past the midterm. So it sounds like they want to repeal it, but they really don't want to live with the consequences of repeal, which is going to be um, that it affects whether 30 million people continue to have coverage. Now, they're talking about doing replace, but if you're going to replace and you're actually going to cover 30 million people, you're going to have to do considerably something considerably similar to what Obama did in the first place. So most of the ideas that they've been floating around are ideas in healthcare reform that have been out for the last 20 years. Med mal reform, buying across state lines, creating high cost plan options, those already exist. And they don't generate coverage. You get coverage through subsidies because people who don't have coverage don't have it because they can't afford it. So they're gonna suffer through the, the challenge of developing a replace. They've also got a slew of other stuff that they just have to do. They gotta fill 4,000 positions in government. They gotta get their cabinet confirmed. They gotta get a Supreme Court nominee through the Senate. They gotta address the debt ceiling. They got to fund the remainder of the 2017 fiscal year. They got to fund the fiscal 2018 year. They've got a bunch of health legislation and other authorizing legislation. They always do a Department of Defense authorization bill. So they got a slew of things to do. And there's no consensus on what they're trying to do with respect to tax reform. The Senate is by no means in the same place that the House is on this. So they've got to identify the offsets. You know, um, Ryan's thrown out three trillion of them. They got to address the overall cost. If they don't find the offsets or if they have to, if they can't use the ones that are on the table, they got to find others. They got to consider the scope of the bill and they got to come to some consensus on what is a movable bill, potentially without any Democratic support. So they got their, they got their plate full. Well, and there's, and I, I talked to a, uh, a CEO of a major trade group uh, this morning who was, uh, who's particularly interested in unrelated issues on the corporate tax rate and, um, and on the corporate side of tax reform. And there's whole coalitions now that are literally being formed by the day that are um, concerned about some of the provisions in what, uh, Jeff, you characterize as the offset, right? In order to get the lower rate, move to a territorial system as the blueprint provides, you know, that does come with a cost. And there's this cross tension between even some Senate Republicans who, you know, some have advocated as as Leader McConnell has to uh, make sure this is revenue neutral, while others have said, you know, there should be no revenue offset. So it is a uh, it, there's a lot of uh, runway left on the road, and it sort of sort of harkens back to Sam's comments earlier, which is, you know, the smart money is that this will twist and turn uh, through the process over the coming year. And the smart money is on plan today based on what the current law is, uh, because invariably proposals will morph and change as it moves through the legislative process. And, um, and uh, you just never know what the ultimate outcome is. Uh, last time we did fundamental tax reform was in 1986, and that process started in 1984. And had a widely uh, popular uh, president, Ronald Reagan, and it nearly died a number of times, and there was bipartisan support for it. So um, we shall see where it goes. We'll be active in the process. Uh, but Jeff, last question for you before we uh, kind of wrap up here. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying that tax reform is going to get done by August. Uh, what's your view on that? You know, if I had to bet my house on something, I, I, I bet they get to something. The question is what the something is. It's, you know, all of the timing pressures that we just described, all of the substantive questions that we just outlined about what the content of the, this bill is going to be are yet to be decided. So um, there's a blueprint. I think Ryan will be successful at moving that something sim substantially similar to it through the House. But then they're going to hit the roadblock of the Senate. And they simply can't lose more than two senators. And that is going to be their limiting factor. So I would suspect he will end up, Trump will be successful in driving something over the finish line, getting agreement among Republicans to move something exactly the way Clinton did and as did Bush and as did Obama on the health care bill. But what the it is, is 
completely unknown. I would be surprised if they failed to do anything. But I think there is some capacity to reach a consensus on elements of corporate reform and territoriality. But that isn't a $4 trillion um, massive gamble on um, the fiscal soundness of our country. And, and Jeff, you believe the estate tax repeal uh, will be among that it? Or do you think that um, there's a lot of uh, room left uh, where that's in some doubt? There certainly is a desire among a large segment of the Republican caucus to repeal the estate tax. There is virtually no appetite for it among Democrats. And um, it is stunning when you realize that the exemption level is at $11 million, that any Trump voter actually thinks that that's a good idea. It, certainly the core voters that he drew into the party in this last cycle. So I think that's still to be seen. There's no question they're going to make a run for it. But there's no question that substantively, it just doesn't jibe with who elected this guy. And depending on the package and maybe putting a state tax to the side, it, there, there may be some capacity from your vantage point uh, on lowering the corporate tax rate, maybe not all the way down to 15, the way Trump said, or 20 in the, in the blueprint, but you know, 25 or something like that, harmonizing it with the pass-through rate at 25, as Sam suggested earlier. Um, maybe there's some capacity for uh, Senate Democrats in red states to participate in some tax reform bill. Uh, what are your thoughts on that quickly? Yeah, if, if we just got off of this um, massive bill and into something more targeted that um, uh, involved infrastructure spending, which Trump has identified as a priority as well, and which addressed the competitive disadvantage that our international tax system uh, creates for domestic companies, there's a receptivity among Democrats for that. But that isn't massive across the board individual and corporate rates, and it isn't massive changes in tax of investment income. Democrats are of the view that investment income should be taxed at the same level as wage income. They, and as I would suspect, uh, that would be the view of most of the new Trump voters. Um, and so there's a lot of education that still has to be done on what the content of this is in those political puts and takes have to play themselves out before we know what it is. But I think they'll get to an it in September. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Sam, any, any closing comments that you think our, our members need to be aware of or you think we need to address uh, before I, I wrap here? Well, the only thing I would say is that uh, being somewhat removed uh, from Washington, uh, it sure seems like there are a lot of items on the agenda, you know, from healthcare legislation to immigration reform to infrastructure spending. Um, and certainly those things seem to be of more importance to, as Jeff referenced, the, the people that really put Trump over the goal line. Um, so I can only imagine that tax reform is going to be uh, sort of struggling for attention amongst all the other pressures that they'll have, including all the things that we don't know are yet to happen in 2017. So um, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. Well, well, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, just to illustrate the point, I had a meeting last week with a very, very senior Republican and uh, he talked about the appetite among House members to do some big things, but he used it an illustration that you know when they get when they come back in January, they'll be back the first week of January and be hit the ground running even before the president elect is uh, sworn in. It, the House Republicans will take a day to pass the budget resolution that will provide the authority to repeal Obamacare. That same vote will take two weeks in the Senate. So the, the ability to process legislation in the Senate, uh, whether that's nominees, Supreme Court justices, tax reform, Obamacare repeal, what have you, it, it, it just takes time. And I think the thing that we are committed to doing is, you know, number one, making sure we fulfill our mission and serving our, our membership in the profession by providing you with the tools through the navigating the new administration series. Um, and then on the advocacy side, we really believe strongly at ALU that 
this is the among the most noble professions that there is, and it needs to be promoted. Uh, for too long, the industry has been on the defensive, and we need to more effectively align the industry resources so that we can move on offense. Uh, and what I'd encourage each of you to do, and, and we thank you for your participation and your engagement in ALU, is to you know think about who else should be part of the crowd. If you can refer one member, uh, email me at al at caden at alu dot org. Uh, get a hold of Carla Kirk. Um, but we just need to have all of the the interested parties in our industry working together, driving a unified voice, and making sure that as the new Congress and the new administration considers big public policy issues, that our voice is heard because we know that the country, everybody in the country needs more insurance and more retirement security, and you all are the tools to help make people make those decisions and help them uh, uh, take care of their own financial security. So with that, I want to thank uh, all of the questioners and uh, Sam and Jeff, thank you. And on behalf of everybody at ALU, wish everyone a happy holidays and uh, happy new year. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, continuing the work uh, between now and the end of the year and then hit the ground running in early January. So Thank you so much and have a uh, terrific end of your year.